As China grew richer and stronger, we believe that the Chinese Communist Party would liberalize and meet the rising democratic aspirations of its people. Unfortunately, it turned out to be very naive. Why does China want world domination at all costs? It is an open secret that China plans to surpass the US as the world's leading superpower. It has been publicly affirming its ambitions in the form of development projects like Made in China 2025 and the One Belt, One Road program, or under the guise of slogans like creating a community of common destiny for mankind. China experts have written articles and books about China's plans for world domination. Major Western companies have been bought in recent years by Chinese firms. Governments and businesses around the world are choosing to keep quiet about the CCP's human rights abuses because they're subject to Chinese political and economic pressure. China is already at the top of the list of countries with the biggest GDP by purchasing power parity. One major question is not if China wants to pursue world domination, but why do they seek it? Now let's be clear, the Chinese Communist Party is a Marxist-Leninist organization. The party General Secretary Xi Jinping sees himself as Joseph Stalin's successor. The Chinese Communist Party is the last ruling Communist Party that never split with Stalin, with the partial exception of North Korea. Communists have always been aiming towards world revolution. Their goal is to transform the entire world into one giant communist entity. Since the early stages of their ideology, they believed communism would derive from a strong capitalist economy. In Karl Marx's view, history has to progress through several stages. The so-called primitive communism of the Stone Age, antiquity's slave-based society, feudalism, capitalism, and finally, communism, preceded by a transitional phase named socialism. The communist revolution was supposed to start in the most advanced capitalist countries in Western Europe and then spread to the whole world. The Russian revolution was an unexpected event. But after Lenin took power, he revised the communist ideology. The result became known as Marxism-Leninism. And it supported the idea that communism can be established in a seemingly backward country like Russia. As much as communists despise capitalism, they saw it as a necessary step in the progression of society. Seen in this light, China's adoption of a free market economy, while maintaining strict totalitarian control and a socialist ideology, seems to be closer to the communist doctrine rather than deviating from it. The CCP's concept of community of common destiny for mankind also hints at the fact that the final goal of global communism is alive and well in the minds of Chinese leaders. Every authoritarian regime has one major threat that it must face, that its people will someday learn the tastes of freedom from outside and they will decide that they're willing to fight for it. So dictatorships have two basic options. The simplest one is to limit the citizens' contact with the outside world. North Korea does that best. The other is to dominate the rest of the world and make it less of a threat, even to the point that it resembles your own country's system. China didn't dare to bet on the second option while it was a poor country. It became more and more tempting as it gained power. And at some point, the CCP realised it had no other option. There is also a complementary incentive, the mentality of Chinese elites. 
We must understand something about the present day Chinese economy. It resembles more a giant oligarchy than a real free market. While the regular Chinese citizen can make some money through hard work and entrepreneurship, big business is always around political influence. You can't make anything significant to China without proper connections inside the party bureaucracy and giving the right bribes to the right people. The people that become prominent in China are the ones that are most nimble at using personal connections, bribes and political influence. Chinese elites resent meritocracy and fair competition. They don't like freedom because they adapted to living inside an autocratic state. They will not only suppress it inside China, but would rather have the whole world adopt the Chinese model of society. During the Cultural Revolution, every aspect of traditional Chinese culture has been suppressed in order to create space for communist ideology and the cult of Mao Zedong's personality. However, after Mao's death, the ideological war on tradition diminished. In this environment, many aspects of traditional Chinese culture, like traditional medicine or martial arts, experienced a revival. The most popular were traditional Chinese exercises known as Qigong, practiced mostly for better health and emotional balance. Hundreds of such Qigong practices kept appearing in China. Among them, one such practice named Falun Gong appeared in 1992. It was distinguished by two main features. One was that its health benefits were spectacular, surpassing other Qigong schools in efficiency. The other is that it included a whole coherent system of values centered around the main principles of truth, compassion and forbearance. Chinese people started to practice Falun Gong in massive numbers. Just after seven years in 1999, the estimated number of practitioners in China was close to 100 million. Its popularity attracted the jealousy of Jiang Zemin, then president of China. He managed to convince the other party leaders that Falun Gong could become a competition to the ideological dominance of the CCP and launch a ferocious campaign of persecution against it based on his order, defame their reputations, bankrupt them financially and destroy them physically. Zhang was seen as a weak leader and resented by many in the party bureaucracy. So he used the upheaval created by the persecution campaign to consolidate his power and place his cronies in all the key positions of power. No means were considered excessive in the persecution of Falun Gong, from arrests, torture, psychiatric abuse, to defamation in mass media, forced layoffs and harassment of family members. The terror of the Cultural Revolution was back in force. The whole strength of the state was set in motion to destroy peaceful meditators. However, it was like fighting the wind with a sword. Falun Gong consisted just of a set of exercises and a way of life. No memberships or money involved. No objects or places of worship. Anyone anywhere could have been a Falun Gong practitioner. With tens of millions of so-called enemy of the state everywhere, the CCP had to bolster its suppression and control apparatus to mind-boggling dimensions, effectively turning the country into a police state. Falun Gong practitioners reacted by raising awareness about the atrocities of the CCP and started a movement called Quit the Party where people are encouraged to quit their CCP affiliation and denounce the crimes of the ruling Communist Party. The CCP was supposed to eradicate Falun Gong in just three months, but this became an ongoing struggle. Even more, Falun Gong started to become popular outside of China, and this became an international issue. Every category of people the CCP persecuted until then like Chinese intellectuals, landowners, Tibetans or democracy activists, was a group that posed little interest to the outside world. 
but Falun Gong could appeal to anyone in the world with its strong health benefits, no costs involved and a relaxed approach to organisation. With no restrictions related to ethnicity, age, religion or social status, Falun Gong had the potential to grow exponentially everywhere else, just like it did inside China. To prevent this, the CCP started to massively promote anti-Falun Gong propaganda in the international community. It also used its political and economic influence to incentivize the world's politicians and business leaders to abstain from any acts of support towards Falun Gong and to suppress the spread of Falun Gong outside China before its popularity would become a threat to the CCP. If the situation went beyond their control and the public inside and outside China would realise that they spent huge resources persecuting tens of millions of innocent people with utmost cruelty, the legitimacy of the CCP's rule in China would be at stake. But actually they realise that it is surprisingly easy to influence the rest of the world into following the CCP's interest. After the end of the Cold War, the free world didn't have a major enemy to struggle against anymore. It became busy pursuing regional interests and fighting elusive terrorists. The remaining communist regimes were expected to follow the path of countries in Eastern Europe and eventually develop into free democratic societies. The opening of the Chinese economy to private property and business strengthened the belief that China would follow suit. What really happened was that the CCP decided to take full advantage of this naive trust. While the most powerful nations were not paying attention, China stealthily used all the tricks that it could think of to increase its power. These include unfair trade practices, the hijacking of intellectual property, massive propaganda campaigns, influencing the policies of other countries and international organisations, and more. To achieve its purpose, the CCP either directly infiltrated its own agents or determined key influential people to align themselves with Chinese interests. They were co-opted using a combination of tempting promises, like access to the large Chinese market and advantageous loans, bribes or blackmail. But this leak shows that party branches are embedded in some of the world's biggest companies and even inside government agencies. That's right, Communist Party branches have been set up inside Western companies. While its power increased, the Chinese Communist Party saw that the world kept silent about its nefarious activities and dared to become more and more unscrupulous. It no longer just uses labour camps to punish political enemies. It employs them en masse to erase the identity of whole populations, like in Xinjiang, while making money out of free labour. It no longer just persecutes Falun Gong practitioners. It kills them to sell their organs in a wide state-sanctioned organ harvesting practice. It no longer tries to exert indirect pressure in Hong Kong. It passes legislation to directly abolish the freedoms of Hong Kong citizens and employs police to suppress protests. It no longer threatens countries with worsening diplomatic relations, but tries to directly control foreign governments using shady tactics like debt traps and bribes. It no longer tries to get a hold on foreign intellectual property and technology by hacking and stealing, but it convinces foreign companies to simply give them away by conditioning access to the Chinese market by creating Chinese foreign joint ventures. The Chinese Communist Party has committed so many atrocities and wrongdoings in their quest for power and control that they have reached a point of no return. It's all or nothing now. They will either end up controlling the world or be prosecuted in the Nuremberg-style trial. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the judgment of the tribunal. For over a decade, the People's Republic of China has stood publicly accused of acts of cruelty and wickedness. Just the irresponsible management that led to the COVID-19 disease becoming a global pandemic would be reason enough for them to be put under accusation. 
In a nutshell, having world domination in its communist DNA, the CCP feared that its citizens would develop a taste for freedom and it would share the fate of the Soviet Union. While trying to suppress the practice of Falun Gong worldwide, it realised that its propaganda and control must become international, but also how divided and naive the free world is. As few dare to take real steps to oppose or criticise it, the CCP decided to take full advantage and now aims for world domination simply because it has the power to do so. On the other hand, they have reached a point of no return because of the harm caused to so many people inside and outside of China. Their leadership doesn't change like in democratic societies, so their goals do not change either. They can pursue them to the end no matter how long it takes. But their power has been constructed on a shoddy foundation, the greed of certain officials and businessmen and the naivety and confusion of the others. If a wave of antagonism to the Chinese Communist Party would engulf public opinion, things would change course. Under internal and external pressure, the CCP is even likely to collapse. And we would live to see a China that is free of communism.